So, here we are, folks, the end of Phase 4 of the MCU. And what a phase it's been. If you were to ask me to list my favourite moments from the last 16 releases, I'd have to say... Um... So anyway, my channel being only a year old, I wasn't around for the last Black Panther film, and so I missed that chance to be called a racist for not liking a badly written piece of garbage, portraying an isolated African tribe as a bunch of spear-chucking, loincloth-wearing, monkey-noise-making savages who structure their society around pre-modern ideals of governance, like having kings kick their challengers off waterfalls and whose only route toward modernity came from the fortuitous landing in their territory of a magical meteor containing a metal so hard that their Stone Age tools couldn't possibly have put a dent in it. Yeah, you did hear that right. You are a racist for not liking a portrayal of black people as spear-chucking, monkey-noise-making, loincloth-wearing, militaristic savages, because the fact that we finally got to see a bunch of spear-chucking, monkey-noise-making, loincloth-wearing, militaristic savages leading a major Hollywood film made the original Black Panther a cultural moment. And if you aren't on board with cultural moments, you are a racist. That's how the world worked in 2018, and not much has changed since. If you dared suggest that, in fact, patronizing a whole rich continent of people in order to satisfy the segregationist wish-fulfillment fantasies of African-American intellectuals and their white lefty simps might not be a good use of the medium of film, you were also a racist. Point out that the entirety of human history shows that the most isolated peoples are the most backward regardless of what natural resources exist below their feet, because they don't have the knowledge to make use of them. Yeah, yeah, that was a pretty racist thing as well, my dude. You should probably take a long, hard look in the mirror and ask why you're so opposed to black people having their cultural moments, you evil, racist bastard you. Wakanda is a progressive beacon because, while the entire continent was suffering multiple AIDS, malaria, hunger, and drought crises, they all stood around telling themselves how pure they were while doing precisely fuck all to help anyone. And if you pointed out that you cannot simultaneously believe Wakanda's exclusively black population should be championed, while also holding to the theory that diversity is our strength, well, you get the idea. Happily for me, though, we have a Black Panther 2 now out at the cinema, and it turns out that you don't even have to make criticisms of this film to be considered a racist. At least according to this fine specimen of humanity, if you're white and you go and see the film, that makes you a racist. If you really want to prove to black people that you love us and you care about us and you are down for the cause, do not go see that movie opening weekend. You buy your ticket, you give it to a black person or a black family who can't afford to go, and then you go sit at that theater in front of the doors. You make sure that every black person in that theater can enjoy that movie in peace. You make sure that you use your body to block us from anybody who would be coming in that theater to do us harm. That is your job. You can go see it on another weekend, go see it on the second or third weekend, but the first weekend, that's for us. To do anything other than this is anti-black. Awkwardly, white people not going to see minority-led films is also evidence of racism, and so I guess you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. I'm a racist because a whole swath of society has decided that it is literally impossible not to be a racist, making the term entirely meaningless. This is a review of Black Panther 2, Wakandan Boogaloo, and there will be blood, and also spoilers. If you want fewer spoilers, I did a much shorter review over on my second channel, the link for that is in the description. I will now give you an appropriate and generous amount of time to go away. So the film begins with Shuri frantically trying to do some Wakanda science to save T'Challa, who is dying off screen. Because Chadwick Boseman is dead, remember? The film is almost certainly going to play on this a lot. And you might be thinking, well, rightly so. A talented young actor taken from us when he had so much to offer the world. And if that were all it was, you would be absolutely right to think that. Except that, if I'm right, and the film is going to turn a dead guy into marketing fertilizer, you would also be correct in thinking this a little bit exploitative. Which, given it comes from a studio that happily airbrushes black characters out of marketing material whenever it's trying to fillet the Chinese market in turn for sweet, sweet yen, and also a studio that turned that same much-missed dead guy's Twitter account into a zombie shill for its latest products, well, that's a theory with a bouquet of evidence to support it. If you are going to base a film off the tragic real-life death of a talented actor, 
then the only way to avoid the charge that you are monetizing cancer is to make it a very good, very heartfelt, very meaningful film. I'm not ruling out the prospect at this juncture. I'm just going to note that Thor Love and Thunder also had the rich tragedy of cancer in its setup, and it used that to create, um, well, Thor Love and Thunder. Shuri shouts science stuff at the computer. That's a tongue twister. Try saying it quickly. And the computer gives her small odds of success. She appears to be attempting to synthesize some version of the magical bullshit goop flower that Killmonger burned in the first film, because this will save the Chala. Anyway, she's not having much luck, and then someone from House Valarian turns up to inform her that her brother is with the ancestors now, and we cut to a Wakandan funeral. Is this the right moment to broach the question of recasting? Well, fuck it, why not? The obvious thing to do would have been to dedicate the film to Bozeman, and perhaps then repurpose the usual Marvel intro to depict his life and his talents, much as they did when Stan Lee died. And then, in that tradition comic books have and have had forever, recast the role and proceed with the story. It being the obvious decision doesn't make it the right one, however, you would lose the value of inheritance, the poignance of the taking up of mantles, both of which used properly are rich material in drafting character and motive. I'm sympathetic to the argument that the focus shouldn't be on the man, but rather on the character and the symbol and the story, and so making a film so heavily reliant on his death is to miss the grander point of the continuous narrative. But I'm not devoted to that position. I think you can marry the two positions and use inheritance to emphasize stakes and story and actually do a better job. Again, though, the burden is on the writers to actually do a better job and... Well, we'll come to that. The funeral is what I would describe as African kitsch, much as with a great many of the traditions depicted in the first film. I believe some research did go into the portrayal of African rituals, particularly for that first film, but it doesn't quite escape the label of kitsch, because simply borrowing the most African-looking or African-feeling of rituals still amounts to an attempt by the filmmakers to capture Africanness as its primarily American audience understands it. And this is the audience that tried for a while to tell us that Kwanzaa was a sincere expression of African roots and that not speaking English properly was being faithful to the ancestors. You know, it's, it's, it's like someone once said, it's like, it's like being a mosquito at a nudist colony. You don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes wonder whether Africans are as embarrassed by African Americans as the English are by white Americans or the Irish are whenever Americans claim to be Irish. The Wakandan funeral gives us the whole smorgasbord of Africanness, drums, dances, tribal songs, and makeup. Now, you might want to sit down for this because it's going to come as a shock. I am not, myself, African, so I can't say too much about the authenticity of the get-ups except to say that just borrowing random bits of culture from various real-life tribes and cultures is not of itself authentic, and I would be pleasantly surprised to learn that that is not what's going on here. Much of this sequence is shot in slow-mo, which, if they keep it up, will go some way toward explaining why this film clocks in at two and a half hours. Slow-mo drums, slow-mo procession, slow-mo smiley and happy people dancing. It's, it's a funeral, guys. You might, have, you might have guessed that from the coffin. All the dancers are cheerful and chipper, all the people in the procession itself are somber and downcast. Is that an African tradition? I, I don't know. We also get a long, lingering shot on a poster of T'Challa, in case you were still wondering how much emphasis was going to be placed on Bozeman's death in this film. The Black Panther helmet is being carried behind the coffin, and then we get a flyby by Wakandan's spaceships, which again forces us to ask how and why this is such a technologically, materially, and scientifically bifurcated society. Okay, well maybe not why. It's quite clear these films want us to take home that pre-modern culture and tradition can survive modernity pretty well intact, which is the kind of bullshit you can only believe in if you are yourself a poor, foolish disciple of post-modernity. But, but we still have a film to review, so we'll just brush that aside. The film wants us to feel very sad about all this, and it goes some way toward achieving it, even if it falls flat for its self-indulgent longevity. But it does rather sacrifice the effect when it has the coffin beamed up by one of the spaceships, which kind of makes you wonder whether we'll get a Black Panther 3, the search for Spock, I mean the search for T'Challa one day. One final observation on this aspect of the film, because I don't recall seeing it remarked upon elsewhere. This is not the first time in-universe T'Challa has been, for most intents and purposes, 
dead. He was Thanos snapped out of existence in Infinity War. And until the Hulk snapped everyone back into existence, those who were gone were presumed to be gone forever. And this should have colored the Charter's funeral in Wakanda forever. We all get and understand the trauma of death, of losing loved ones. Very few of us have ever had to lose the same loved one twice. While it's forgivable that Wakanda Forever should devote so much time exclusively to mourning, it does also need to exist as a film in its own right, telling and continuing a story, and to make itself a part of its grander universe. That it hasn't done that is not a unique failing. We were told way back when that Phase 4 was all about dealing with the fallout from the blip. Yet with the exceptions of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Spider-Man, Phase 4 has been spectacularly disinterested in the consequences of the blip. In fact, we seem to have moved on as though it had never occurred. Wakanda Forever, if it were interested in a broader exploration of grief, as opposed to merely tacking on a funeral to a generic Marvel movie, would have taken this opportunity to ask or present interesting questions about the nature of grief, to look at the difference between suspected and known loss, to examine how the experience of the blip impacted their experience of the Charter's death perhaps suggesting that the loss of an immediate friend and loved one somehow outmatches the loss of billions of nameless faces in its pain and its poignance, and then dealing with the grief and perhaps even the guilt that would stem from such a conclusion. But this is phase four of the MCU, so nah, fuck it. We have to make whales fight UFOs, so on with the plot. We do then indeed get the Chadwick devoted opening titles, meaning everything I've said thus far has been critiquing a pre credit scene. Better brace yourself then, folks. I think this might be a long one. We flash forward a year later when the Queen of Wakanda, Ramonda, mother of T'Challa and Shuri, has been summoned to a United Nations session where some boilerplate white bureaucrat upbraids her for Wakanda's failure to share resources and to cooperate with the wider world as it had promised it would do at the close of the first film. Gee, I wonder if we're going to get lessons on whitey hypocrisy. Well, not immediately at least. Though Ramonda does explain that Wakanda doesn't share vibranium not because of its dangerous potential, but because of, and I quote, the dangerous potential of you. How is she queen exactly? Don't lines of succession typically go either downward or laterally? The Charla had no kids, that we know of, so wouldn't the title have automatically gone to Shuri rather than back up to his mother? Regardless who it went to, at what point can the right to succession by combat be invoked? If Killmonger had waited just a few years, could he have become king just by kicking either an old woman or a small girl off a waterfall? Does anything about Wakanda make sense? Well, no, but it's a very advanced, very civilized, and in all ways superior place, so who cares? We then cut to the outreach center, opened by T'Challa at the end of the first film, so I guess this one deserves props for not simply forgetting its existence. Though, and I might be wrong here, it wasn't a very memorable film. But wasn't part of the point and purpose of that center to share Wakandan resources with the world? Did that not include vibranium? If not, then what precisely could Wakanda have shared via the center, given how much of its technology is based around vibranium? If it did include vibranium, how could they possibly have controlled its usage, given a little bit of it in the wrong hands made Ultron? And yet, how is it not already in circulation, given Gollum went in and out on a whim stealing things and selling them on? And then, if they refuse to share it and they can't sell it because their technology is derived from it, what can they sell? How can they help? How can they afford the cost of helping the wider world? And if they were selling it, at what point would they have run out, given any asteroid made of so hard a metal in sufficient quantity as to provide near endless product would probably have wiped out the Earth on impact? It's almost as if Wakanda makes no fucking sense. We then flit back and forth between a military raid on said outreach center and Queen Ramonda scolding the United Nations for wanting to use the Charter's death as an excuse to exploit Wakanda against its will. She even mentions that she knows rumors in their military establishments, which leaves you wondering, if you knew you couldn't trust the various nations of the world not to invade and steal your magical bullshit metal, why would you leave your outreach center open to attack in the first place? Ah, but then you see, it was all a ruse. It turns out the center is protected by by the um the Dor Dora Mel Dor the Dora the Explorers, and as Queenie tells the UN, now is our time to strike, the explorers duly do their striking. 
Michonne from The Walking Dead has a chat with Discount Michonne while they go about slicing through the soldiers, criticizing her for not having brought her spear with her. Discount Michonne tells Michonne that she prefers her laser daggers that Shuri gave her because she just does, whereupon Michonne channels Shad in giving a passionate argument for why sticks are better than guns and knives. Our mothers gave us a stick because it is precise, elegant, and deadly. He got stick. Good on him, okay? Sometime, some distance later, the door of the explorers bring the evil whitey soldiers that they didn't slice into pieces into the United Nations chamber. I guess it's just been in permanent sitting for the entire duration of their trip in order that Ramonda can threaten the United Nations with war if they try that shifty shit again. We then jump away to the Atlantic Ocean, where a ship sends some submarine scientists down to the ocean floor to inspect a drill that has, um, it's found some vibranium. They have a vibranium detecting machine. Lead scientist woman pointedly says it's the only one we've got, which I'm sure will be very relevant later. But you might be thinking, hold on a minute. I thought the world's sole source of vibranium was the Wakandan meteor. Now you're telling me there's more of it? How much more of it? Where? How? To begin with? If it's under the water, why hasn't James Cameron found it already? How did they build a machine capable of locating it? Who built a machine capable of locating it? Why is there only one such machine? How, given the vibranium wrecks the drill bit on their very advanced piece of machinery, did the first Wakandans manage to mine it with Stone Age tools? By the way, if you were about to answer any of these questions with, well, it's in the comics, no, fuck off and go away. The MCU and the comics universe are not the same thing. The comics are far from a reliable guide anyway, as we are about to see. These questions and their consequences will have to be accounted for by the MCU, preferably in this film. They have significant connotations, some of which we will come on to in a moment. Otherwise, though, we've just invented another source of vibranium and a random one-off contrivance machine solely as an excuse for the plot to happen. And we will come back to that in a moment as well. For now, one of the underwater scientists gets distracted by a pretty jellyfish and so misses that her colleague has just been torn off his lifeline by some unseen foe. Then she gets killed off screen. Above the waterline, just, just bear with me here and remember that this film is a sincere and heartfelt tribute to a much loved and dead actor. Some Aztec mermaids appear and sing the guards on the ship into committing suicide, though their song courteously holds off having its full effect long enough for main scientist woman and chief CIA man it's a CIA ship, by the way, to put in earplugs. Now, as usual, I'm going to try and make sure to compliment the film where it deserves compliments, and this scene does eerie well enough. It feels sinisterly enchanting, largely through its sound design and its lighting. It's quite well shot. Mermaids tricking sailors with song is quite a long-established characteristic. Aztecs doing it, though, ah, uh, not a thing as far as I'm aware. Why am I calling them Aztec mermaids? Well, because Namor, the villain of this piece, to whom we are shortly to be introduced, has been race-swapped. We need you to act like a Middle Eastern terrorist right away. There's just one problem. I don't look Middle Eastern. <laughs> Leave that to us. Even the Atlanteans aren't safe from the race-swappers, though the motive in this case would appear to be that Marvel feared an Atlantean villain would clash too much with Aquaman. This at least has been cited by Shill Rant, I mean Screen Rant, as a primary reason why the race and history swap was a good idea. Though I can't help but note that if we're now in the position where Marvel is looking so fearfully over its shoulder at what DC is doing, it's because the quality chasm between these two studios has decreased rapidly in the last few years. And DC has not got very much better in that time, which should tell you all you need to know about the MC's phase-long nosedive. Anyway, the merman attack the ship, and head scientist woman calls in a strike team. She and chief CIA guy run away and get accosted by the merman, whose physical design isn't quite up to the sound design of their song. The shark-like headpiece one of them wears puts one in mind of the Flying Dutchman's crew in Pirates of the Caribbean. Otherwise, they're blue? That's their most distinctive characteristic. She shoots at one of them, and by that I mean she, she really does shoot at him. She shoots at him 
a lot, as in she basically empties a magazine at him, or would have if her pistol didn't have unlimited ammo. She fires at any rate a good number of rounds, and he doesn't die. Armor, you might think? Well, no, 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 he's not really wearing very much of that. Bulletproof skin, then? No, no, it's, it's not that either, because as she runs to the chopper, she shoots a number of them, and they do indeed, at least seem, to die. Meaning the one she was closest to, the one standing still, right in front of her, not more than a few feet away, got hit seven, eight, or even nine times, conveniently, in his little piece of armor, while all the rest of them were unlucky enough to get hit in the 85% plus of their body that wasn't covered by armor. Meaning, essentially, that she was aiming for the one place guaranteed not to kill him. And he looked quite an important guy, meaning her failure to kill him could end up being very important indeed. She makes it to the chopper, which takes off. Kind of lucky the pilot had just been sitting there for hours with his headphones on, otherwise he'd have got tricked into the sea by the merman. She gets on the radio and informs someone that the merman aren't Wakandans because, well, because they're blue. Seems a bit racist. Are you saying blue people can't be Wakandans? But I thought diversity is our strength. Incidentally, this will not be the only film featuring water-based indigenous blue people to release between now and Christmas. Wakanda Forever vies with Avatar The Last Smurf Bender for an award nobody knew existed, Best Supporting Smurf on Screen. The nominees are this guy and, and, and this guy. I don't, I don't know either of their names, and I don't care. The helicopter flies off, but the merman use some kind of magical power that makes the helicopter crash. The camera pans away and we see one of the merman flying. How very mysterious. Back to Wakanda, which we know before we see it because we get an African man shouting music at us, and Raimonda Valerian and Michonne fly through the cloaking shield, which for some reason is now controlled by a Wakandan drumming a tray full of water. Are you serious? It's, it's almost as if Wakanda makes no fucking sense. Have they reactivated the cloaking device since the Charla promised Wakanda would reveal itself to the world? Like they withheld resources and cooperation after he promised to open his country up to the global society and then had a bitch when people pointed out that they weren't upholding their trade agreements? Well, I guess they must have. And I suppose, well, you might be able to make the cloaking device make sense given they now fear attack from the outside world again. Shuri is doing more science. She's designing new exosuits for the Wakandan army. Evidently, she's finally decided that magical cloaks and spears might not befit the army of a hyper-advanced civilization that aspires to the title of and indeed calls itself the most powerful nation on Earth. Queen Ramonda doesn't like Shuri's AI. She says it might wake up and take over the world, but Shuri explains that AI isn't like it is in the movies. Except, well, she knows it is. She must know that it is, because that's exactly what happened with fucking Ultron. And she doesn't have the excuse of ignorance, because it's well established that Wakanda has excellent intelligence services and has long known what goes on beyond the boundaries of its magical kingdom. This isn't a small thing, it's not a tiny technical matter. It would be mildly irritating for an MCU film to discard a minor development in a previous story, but we now seem to have reached the point where characters have entirely forgotten the events of the main Avengers films, which suggests lazy-ass writing, if nothing else. Shuri doesn't want the mantle of Black Panther, she explains that she thinks it's a relic. That said, Given she was intimately involved in making and updating the suit, and given she still sees the value in suits, otherwise she'd not now be making them for the army, you might think that she, of all people, would see the utility in the mantle, or at least the trappings of the mantle. This, by the way, isn't a bad trope by any means. They would seem to be establishing her as the reluctant superhero. It's been done many times, but it's been done many times for a reason. It can form an important part of the hero's journey. The usual difficulty is in keeping it fresh. Wakanda Forever has gone some way toward achieving that through its setup because it's a device bound up in the death of her brother and her failure in curing him of whatever condition he had in universe. The problem here is largely a practical one. Shuri is, as mentioned, one of the people most likely to see the utility of the Black Panther and certainly of the suit. It's not quite enough for her to simply say the mantle is a relic. To make it accord with the character they've actually written, There would, or there will, we've still got a ways to go yet, maybe they'll do this, but there would or will have to be a more pronounced aversion to that suit in particular as the emblem of the mantle, which would be relatively easy to establish and also quite effective, necessary even, in order to ground her objection to something of massive technological potential 
in her character rather than beyond it. The film wants to tell us that she has no time for tradition. It does not want to tell us that she has no time for technology. In rejecting the Black Panther suit, she is rejecting technology, whereas if it were simply tradition she was opposed to, she shouldn't have a problem taking the suit and divorcing it from the traditional mantle. In order to square this circle, then, you would need to tie tradition and technology together in her own mind. We don't get that approach in this scene, alas, because we then cut away to nighttime, where she and Queen Ramonda are sitting outside in the bush by a campfire watching the elephants. They have a long conversation about T'Challa. Uh, he, he's dead, remember, you, you might not have picked up on that yet. And Queen Ramonda Valerian, first of her name, talks about a ritual she used to meet T'Challa again, something again that Shuri rejects on the grounds that she doesn't like tradition. This is another piece of the reluctant superhero trope being put into place, but I can't help but think that this might have been the moment to explore that aspect of her character described above, how tradition, technology, and her memory and sadness at the loss of her brother all link together. That is certainly what the film wants to convey, I'm just not sure it's conveyed it particularly well at this stage. Queen Ramonda's ritual involves sitting and looking at the fire and burning some ritual clothes. Shuri delivers a fairly well-crafted but somehow slightly uncanny line. She says that if she sits and looks at the fire too long, it won't just be the ritual clothes she burns, it'll be the world. And, well, it's a powerful line, but I think the film risks being a bit presumptuous. It's basing an awful lot, the entirety even, of its emotional force in the death of a real-world actor channeled through the in-universe death of a character. The real-world death of the actor is, of course, a tragic thing, but these two worlds are separate. It's not easy to bleed one into the other. I'd be willing to bet a large number of the real-world audience registered Bozeman's death, but didn't feel it as any kind of familial loss. It was a sad thing that did happen. For the cast and the writers, it evidently was a deep loss indeed. But you can't perfectly transpose the personal loss of people who knew and worked with Bozeman into the audience's response to the death of a character off-screen. Black Panther the character was, as I said in the video on my other channel, cool enough. He had his moments. To people who bought into the first film's cultural moment and who did see him as an icon, well, yeah, sure, the character's death would have a more than usual impact, but we are still forced to remember that in the grander context, the Black Panther was a late arrival, with a soul-dedicated film that had quite particular appeal, and without a huge amount of consequential screen action, or time to engage in the relationships we're here being asked to inhabit. So, sure, on an intellectual level, the audience member can understand the reactions of these characters, but the film seems not so much keen that we feel everything they feel, but rather to just assume that we do. Only if that assumption is correct can we really invest in scenes like this, or make sense of lines that sound so drastic as Shuri's about burning the world. And with all respect to the late actor, his friends, and his colleagues, I'm really not sure that our own relationship with the character is strong enough for the film's desired emotional weight to impact us as the film wants it to. The sense of loss, of an absence in the universe that followed Tony Stark's sacrifice, and it didn't need screenwriters dialing the emotion meter up to 11 to emphasize the point, because, as the best established and generally best loved character, the franchise Totem, his absence spoke for itself. The Charters doesn't to the same extent or in the same way. In any event, this is a Marvel film, and even the lament can't be allowed to go on too long without being interrupted by stuff. So we get a weird noise and a scared elephant, and then we're introduced to Namor, who floats out of the water on little winged shoes? Or are those wings? No, they're wings from his ankles. He has little white wings on his ankles. Much has been made of Namor's race swapping, and the race swapping of his people, and we might come back to that presently. For now, I have to point out that a not especially shapely man of not ever so imposing height, played by a not all that intense actor who emerges from the water wearing a green nappy with little white wings on his ankles, doesn't make for a particularly imposing villain at all. Curiously, and as we'll see later, he appears to have worn the green nappy since he was a child, absolutely no change in outfit at all over the course of several centuries. He's probably got barnacles on his balls. Namor wants Wakanda's help because T'Challa revealed vibranium to the world, 
even though Queen Ramonda said earlier that they weren't sharing it with the world. And that led American scientists to develop the machine that detected vibranium beneath his people's domain. Ramonda says vibranium only exists in Wakanda, but Shuri points out that he's wearing it, so... Nah. This, of course, doesn't answer any of the questions I posed earlier. It simply invites us to ask them again. How? Where? Why? With the additional question, how is Namor here? How did he find Wakanda, given the film has shown us that it still cloaks itself, even though T'Challa said that it wouldn't? How did he get through its magical bullshit security field? Is that why the film randomly decided to have its cloaking device controlled by banging a tray of water? Just so this Aztec mermaid could float through it uninterrupted because water? Also, how did he float up to precisely this spot at precisely this time to find Ramonda and Shuri preparing to ritual trip? What if he turned up a mile away or an hour ago? Anyway, he asks for their help in finding the American scientist who made the machine. Given this film setup was that Ramonda in particular is keen that Vibranium not get out into the wider world, you would think this point of acutely important shared interest would, well, interest her. But instead she just has a bitch about him turning up uninvited, so he threatens to invade with his massive armies. Now look, I know we're all pretty much deaf to this kind of thing by now, because we're so used to it, but this is not how people speak. This is not how people interact. This is especially not how people speak or interact if the premise of your film actually makes cooperation between these two peoples the most plausible thing to do. The goal is clearly to get Atlantis, uh, I mean the Aztecs, and the Wakandans fighting. But if that's your goal, you either set up the film with a direct line to that point, or else you take care to work from the existing premise to that conclusion. Simply having Freaky Fish Guy here pop up in the middle of the night and threaten to invade because the Wakandan stupidly refused to listen when he outlined their shared concern, well, that's just contrived. It's the least plausible of all possible outcomes to their brief exchange, except insofar as it's the most convenient one for the writers to take, in which case it only makes sense if you assume that the writers are shit. That is a safe assumption, but it's not really one we should have to make. Having threatened to invade them, Namor then gives them a seashell and tells them to blow into it when they have the scientist. He asks them not to tell anyone outside Wakanda about him, and then he leaves. Though when they turn around, they find that a great big old CIA machine is just sitting on the beach next to them. I mean, how did they not notice? Can he use telekinesis as well as live underwater and fly about on his winged boots? What precisely is his power set? I hesitate to say it but they had no reason to fear people confusing Namor with Aquaman. Aquaman, actual Aquaman, makes more sense than this character, and that's really saying something because Aquaman quite proudly made very little sense. In any case, Namor seems like a very dodgy plan. Not only do these people not like you, but the CIA also knows exactly where their ship and helicopter went down. Combine the Wakandan's knowledge of you, and the CIA's knowledge of the location of that vibranium, and the entire vibranium-hungry world knows who you are, where you are, and what you have. Not to mention the fact that if your goal is to have Science Girl kidnapped in order that you can remain hidden, invading a powerful sovereign nation that is at the center of the world's attention is probably the most counterproductive thing you could threaten to do, since that kind of thing is liable to be noticed. Anyway, it's worth taking note at this point, a note about Namor's goals, intentions, and methods. Intention, remain hidden. Goal, remain hidden. Method, kidnap science girl. It's worth noting this down now, because the film will change this up several times over the next however the fuck long, and it will not acknowledge it once. The day or morning after Queen Ramonda calls the council, where Rumbaku and Michonne trade insults. And then everyone has a perfunctory debate about what to do. I quite like M'Baku, by the way. He's characterful and he's humorous, and his humor actually befits his character, unlike the cut and paste joke a minute style of most MCU entries. He also refers to Namor as Fishman, which is a name I'm basically using already, and he calls Michonne a bald headed demon, which is also quite funny. They all seem to take Freaky Fish Guy's word about his massive armies, but M'Baku, portrayed as a bit simple and boneheaded, nonetheless asks the most pertinent question. If they do what Freaky Fish Guy asks, 
what would stop him coming back and asking for more? But we don't get an answer to that yet, because we're back in the science lab where Michonne and Ramonda find Shuri playing about with the CIA machine, which she confirms does indeed work. It can detect vibranium. Michonne raises the how is there more vibranium question again. Shuri reasons that there was probably just another vibranium meteor that landed in the sea. Um, it, no, that, that, no, that still doesn't really answer most of the important questions. And in fact, it invites yet another one. How many vibranium meteors are out there in the galaxy? Is the asteroid belt just full of them? How many have crashed on Earth over the years? If it's multiple, the odds of it remaining undiscovered shrink. Have they landed anywhere else? Does anywhere else in the galaxy now have access to vibranium? This planet now has ready access to space and apparently a device capable of detecting vibranium. If it's just floating around out in the asteroid belt, what's to stop someone building another device? Remember though, for plot convenient reasons, there's only one of them at the moment, and mining some off-planet. Vibranium proliferation has profound consequences for the galaxy, for this planet, and especially for the Wakandans. The film is ever so slightly aware of the consequences for the Wakandans, but it doesn't really seem to have truly appreciated their extent. This affects the entire existence of Wakanda, the only thing they have to their name, the only thing that makes them notable at all to the rest of the world. Well, besides rhino milk, obviously. If vibranium is found elsewhere, they are completely and utterly fucked as a nation. And yet, at the moment, the only question it even occasionally occurs to someone to ask is, wait, how have we just destroyed the setup to the first one? Oh no, I mean, sorry. Wait, tell me again how there can be more vibranium? Michonne just moans that the fable she heard as a kid might now be incorrect. I think there are more important things at stake. Michonne and Shuri then bugger off to meet Bilbo Baggins with Ramonda's permission. Shuri's favorite colonizer. Bitch, please, if you'd been colonized, you would not be sticking vibranium in fucking spears. Michonne tells Bilbo that they're looking for the scientist who've built the vibranium detector, assuming from the off that he would know. Which leads him to say that it was the Wakandans in the Atlantic, was it? They deny Wakandan involvement, of course. They have an argument with Bilbo, and Bilbo tells them that there's only one kid in the world capable of building the vibranium scanner thingy-me, which the CIA presumably just stole while leaving its inventor free and unguarded. So Michonne and Shuri go off to kidnap a girl from school. They have an argument about who is best placed to infiltrate the school and kidnap said child, because for all their complaints about colonizers and whitey pillaging ancestral African homes, the door of the explorers are basically the CIA with less oversight. The Dora Milaje have jurisdiction wherever the Dora Milaje find themselves to be. Which makes Wakanda a fucking terrifying prospect for people of all places and nations. Honestly, at this point, would you bet against the Dora the Explorers drone striking American weddings? It'd be fine, though, because Black Power, because Whitey did it, because America's no better, because drone strikes are the voice of the unheard, because colonialism, because imperialism, delete as expedient. Shuri looks like a child, sounds like a child, dresses like a child, and basically is a child, so she's the one who gets to infiltrate the school. She immediately knows where Child's dorm room is, and Child immediately recognizes her as Princess of Wakanda, meaning I'm once again compelled to ask just what Wakanda's relationship with the rest of the world is. It opened up in the last film, except that it was closed again at the beginning of this one. It remains highly secretive, yet its minor royalty are immediately recognizable to American teenagers? It doesn't trust the rest of the world, yet it happily sends its secret agents to carry out often violent missions and in this case abductions in the rest of the world, it is simultaneously the last and only undespoiled African paradise, yet it is also incredibly limited and at the same time unlimited in its international agency. It's almost as if Wakanda makes no fucking sense. It turns out Schoolgirl, whose name is Bree <coughs> Williams, didn't make the detector for the CIA, she just made it for a school project. Her professor said she'd never be able to do it, and if this film had any regard for internal consistency, the professor would have been right. How can you make a vibranium detector without access to vibranium against which to test it? How does this school even know what vibranium is, given the Wakandans don't share it and don't like talking about it? How does this schoolgirl know the first thing about the properties the machine is supposed to be detecting? But it's fine because she says she is gifted and black. 
You fucking go, girl. You slay, queen. We was science majors, etc. Shuri explains that the school is no longer safe for her, which, given Bilbo was talking about other nations taking an interest in her, should also have been the CIA's conclusion some time ago. So why is she still in school? Why did the CIA presumably raid the science lab to pinch the school project, but not conscript the person who built it? They must have known about her, her talents, and her potential, otherwise why would they have stolen the machine she built? They know how important the machine is, and how unique she is, and therefore how valuable she is. These motherfuckers waterboarded random goat herders for years because their last name sounded vaguely Muslim. Are you telling me they wouldn't have gone all, I'm going to extraordinarily rendition your ass, given the girl is both a national security risk and an incredibly valuable asset that they could have used to create more vibranium detectors? Well, whatever. Apparently the CIA have more regard for child welfare and territorial integrity than the Wakandans, so they just left her in school. So now the Wakandans get to nab her instead. She goes to the bathroom in a fairly transparent attempt to escape, but Michonne strolls out, stops her, and so she starts throwing crap at them in a segment the studio thought funny enough to pre-release. It's not especially funny, the acting is a little bit cringe, but it has one redeeming moment. Shuri deploys reverse psychology and tells Michonne that Riri Williams can definitely handle that merman with the winged ankles who wants to kill her, and Riri's response is a disbelieving what? Which is, yeah, that's basically my response to the plot of this film. Well done, Riri, you're, you're connecting with your audience. Incidentally, the film does what a huge number of disproportionately Marvel films do in telegraphing allegiance. You and I know that the Bacandans are the good guy, and well, actually, no. You and I know they're a bunch of supremacist shits, but we know the film thinks they're the good guys. We also know that Riri Williams here is supposed to be a good guy. And because we know that all these people are good, the film skips over them actually discovering that about each other. As Williams goes from being threatened by Michonne to threatening to throw something at Michonne to slagging off Michonne's non-existent haircut, which is played for laughs. Yeah, I mean, it's an MCU film. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. We have to get that joke quota in. But this kind of telegraphing, this filling in the character's lack of knowledge with the audience's foreknowledge, just great. Oh my god, you're going to kidnap me. Lol, you have no hair, let's be friends, is not good character writing. Characters have to build relationships. Crucially, they have to build trust. This is especially true in the case of Riri Williams, as she's established neither of these things yet and is, but for her inexplicable recognition of Shuri, being faced with two factions, soon to be three when the FBI shows up, who want to kidnap her for unstated and possibly nefarious purposes. If the film were actually interested in Williams as a character, this is the most fertile ground to begin building that character. But as we'll go on to see, the film isn't at all interested in her as a character, it just wants her in this film as a prop. So they go to her garage workshop. What the film is trying to do here is fast-track a relationship between Shuri and Riri Williams by making them basically the same character, or functionally the same character anyway. Riri does science stuff, just like Shuri. Riri is a computer whiz, just like Shuri. Riri is building mech suits, just like Shuri. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shuri presciently points out that it's a bit weird to be working on this hyper-secret stuff and just leave your laptop unattended in a garage, which it is, if you believe that what you're doing is top secret and of interest to foreign governments. Which Riri supposedly doesn't, having just finished telling us that she only cooked up the machine for a school project. She does have some kind of mega encryption on her laptop, but that's basically it. So she simultaneously acts as if she's half aware of the significance of her work, when it's convenient, but is otherwise a perfectly normal kid with no such understanding? Oh well, rightio then. Shuri's AI friend then chimes in to inform them that American law enforcement has arrived. Riri is extremely miffed by this, and they have a brief argument in which Michonne unironically uses the term popo to refer to the police. Cringe. But Shuri compels them to work together and get out of the pickle they are presently pickling in. Riri has an old muscle car. Hmm. Muscle cars? Tech wizard? Builds flying mech suits? I wonder who she is going to turn out to be. You're right, she's the red Power Ranger. We finally have Power Rangers in the MCU. Or is it that gay Transformer nobody remembers? What's that you say? 
all Transformers are gay and Gundam is cosmically better in every conceivable way? Well, you said it. Either way, crossover event of the century. People will rightly hail this as the best MCU film since Love and Thunder. Probably better than Infinity War, even. Who needs the X-Men when you have a gay Transformer? Michonne escapes in the muscle car while Shuri takes a motorbike. The CIA is tracking the chase with a drone, but since Barack Obama isn't flying it, no civilians get killed. Riri Williams, hereafter referred to as Iron Child, flies up, takes out the drone, and then runs out of oxygen and faints, putting her into a freefall. Remember Iron Man? I remember. I remember. Origin stories are so much easier if you can just copy-paste existing material into nominally new characters. She recovers at the last second and pulls out of the dive, just like Tony, and then her suit gives out and she crashes, just like Tony. But before they can get to her, a water grenade lands on the road and Shuri and Michonne crash. Well, I mean, I guess that's new. Then, uh, and you will have to, to bear with me here, Thankfully, they've shown little bits of this in the trailer, so, so hopefully, if you see it, you'll believe it. Anyway, then a troop of mermen leap out of the water on the nose of a killer whale and confront Michonne. I suppose this explains what one cringy shill media site described as their indigenous rage. They were evidently colonized by SeaWorld, and they've learned all the tricks. An Aztec mermaid runs back to deal with the police that parked behind them. The police, who presumably just saw them jump out of the water riding whales. The police, who presumably just saw them use water grenades to blow up fleeing vehicles. The police, who can clearly see that the mermaid is armed. Yet as she runs at them, the only remark one of them thinks it worth making is, Hey, is she blue? Why, yes. Yes, she is. She's also armed and she just leapt off a fucking whale. She's clearly coming to kill you. Do you not think a policeman might have remarked upon anything else? I'm reliably informed the police empty whole magazines at the backs of black people who looked at them funny, but in this state, apparently they just make mundane observations and wait to be killed. We've already had the their blue observation earlier in the film. Besides making the scene vaguely and unintentionally comical, just, just what the hell was this supposed to accomplish? But Mermaid kills the police, while Michonne beats the shit out of the remaining mermen. But they recover, the implication being by some kind of Aztec magic, one of those incredibly useful but undefined powers you can be pretty sure won't pop up later when it would be just as useful. And then she has a fight with Head Fish Guy, or Fish Head Guy if you prefer, who steals her spear and twats her in the head, then knocks her into the water with another of those water grenades. Shuri then intervenes and demands to be taken to Namor, thus saving Iron Child's life. So the mermen kidnap both of them, even though their mission was to kill Iron Child, and they don't profit at all from letting her live. Michonne tries to swim after them, but she can't catch up because she's not a fish and black people can't swim. No, 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 it can't be racist. I read it in The Guardian. It's a thing, honestly. We then cut away to the CIA, where Bilbo Baggins meets up with uh, President Selina Meyer, and she is Selina Meyer, as in Dreyfus is basically playing the same character. Only in this film, of course, she's not the president. She's a CIA bigwig. And we learn she used to be married to Bilbo. They're investigating the aftermath of that fight between the merman Michonne, Shuri, Iron Child on the bridge. And Bilbo picks up some suspicious looking piece of tech. Wakandan anal beads, quite possibly. Then we're back in Wakanda, where Michonne is urging Ramonda Valerian to let her go and rescue Shuri. But instead, Ramonda strips her of her ranks and titles and kicks her out of the door of the explorers. Ramonda does put in a powerful performance, by the way, in giving her reasons that she stood by Michonne in the first film even though Michonne protected Killmonger, and she's now lost both her kids, that she never wanted Shuri to go on the mission to begin with. The performance is strong. It's well acted. It's reasonably well written in the moment. But I can't help but recall that about a second before all of this, she exclaimed that she was the queen of the most powerful nation in the world. And I can't help but remember that she was in the room with Shuri and Michonne when it was decided that Shuri should go on that mission. She was party to the decision. She could have said no, she could have stopped it at any time. Now to be clear, this will only be a flaw if the film continues to pretend that this was not so. It can be made explicable. 
it can even be made to aid the story and the characters. If this is Ramonda's fit of rage leading her to blame Michonne for what was essentially her own mistake, that's something she will have to realize and apologize for. You can maintain the redemption mission that I'm sure Michonne is about to go off on, but the two characters will have to meet in the middle, because the redemption cannot solely be Michonne's. Sure, she failed to protect Shiri, but it was Ramonda's failure of foresight, and indeed as a mother, that put Shiri in that position to begin with. That is something to keep an eye on as the plot progresses, because it'll determine whether the writers have a coherent journey for their characters, or whether they've here opted for the quickest and easiest way to get the plot moving into its next act. Past experience would suggest the explanation from contrivance, but failure isn't set. If it's made right, it'll constitute not spectacular, but at least decent writing, the kind of thing that's been sorely missing from the entirety of Phase 4, and I'm sorry to say, much of this film so far. That brings us to the close of part one of this review. As some more regular viewers of the channel will already be aware, I've just taken on a very exciting but alas super secret, legally secret, writing project. So I've split this review up, it was going to be over two hours long, into segments, probably no more than three, in order that I can get stuff out while still having time to work on the other project. My plan is to get parts two and three up over the course of the next week, a fortnight at most. It will be with you soon enough. If, however, you want to fast forward to an overview of the entire film, as mentioned, there is a short one over on my second channel, and my good friend the movie cynic has done a very good video of his own, which I urge you to check out. Link for that is in the description as well. For now, see you next time.